Let me say good evening to all of us on tonight. We will now call to order the special call agenda of the Muskogee City Council for June 6, 2022. Uh, let us stand for the invocation and flag salute. Shall we pray? Dear Lord, first of all, we come thanking you for the gift of another day. Thank you for all the blessings that you bestowed upon each and every one of us within this day. That I ask that you would just look upon our United States of America a lot of gun violence going on right now. I just ask that you would just bring peace in the streets. Bless those who are fearful during these times. Bless those family members who have lost loved ones behind these senseless crimes. Just ask that you would just shine on your city council members on tonight as we come together to do the business of our community. Let all that we do be in your will and in your way. These and many other blessings we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let us turn to the flag. Attention. Salute. Flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <coughs> Roll call. Mayor Marlon Coleman. Here. Deputy Mayor Jared Reed. Here. Ivory Van. Here. Jamie Stout. Here. Alex Reynolds. Here. Stephanie Jones. Tracy McGee. Here. Tracy Hoos. Here. Shirley Hilton Flannery. Here. Thank you. Item number one. Hold a public hearing to discuss the City of Muskogee budget for fiscal year 2022-2023 and take other necessary action. Let me say before we turn this portion over to Ms. Sweezy that we want to thank her, Dennis Reed, and staffs for all that they have done so far. I'm preparing our budget. We know that Ms. Sweezy is in the interim capacity, nevertheless uh, has done what she can with what she has to be certain that we get to a point with a budget going into the fiscal year 2023. Uh, as we are required to by state law, we are in the first round of public hearing for public consumption so that our public and our residents can understand and have a better uh, knowledge of what we're doing uh, with taxpayer money. Ms. Sweezy. Thank you, Mayor and Council Members. Good evening. I'd like to do a PowerPoint, and it may look familiar to many of you if we, as we have reviewed uh, the current fiscal year budget quite a few times, but I think it's important to note some of our progress and uh, successes this year as we look ahead to next year. The agenda for the uh, presentation, we will discuss the budget process, the uh, status of current year and all our successes so far, some guiding principles, and then our reserve uh, fund policy, and also review strategic initiatives and next steps. I'd also like to point out, you should all have a fresh packet, and this is what we put on the website for review as well. So we can go through it as we go along and it's got department breakdowns as well as each fund. So our process began in March with departments submitting requests. We then held our review meetings in April and started the council discussions and held a retreat in May. Once we have the public hearing tonight, we will uh, formally adopt it with your support next Monday and then send it to the state for filing. So current year fiscal 22, as listed on the screen, general fund is 36.8 million. The other funds are listed below that. Enterprise funds, internal service funds, uh, the MMA capital and the two trust authorities at the bottom. Project progress, uh, we're all familiar with many of these. It's been a very active year with a lot of fun special events as well as some serious programs such as the pandemic that continues. Um, some large weather events, but uh, some really good infrastructure projects as well. So we've got some photos of a few of these. Our street uh, improvement programs continue we move through the different zones, uh, currently finishing northeast, and I'm sure Mike Stewart will talk about the next zone, and Jeff as well, um, on our public works meeting tonight. 
a little hard to see this, but this uh, shows our different zones we're working through on the street maintenance five-year program. Next fiscal year, we'll, we'll move into the northwest zone. This is our uh, bridge for the Four Corners project that we've been working on this year to alleviate some of the congestion downtown with traffic. So another success this year. The COVID vaccine pod program, very important, very successful at MLK Center. So thank you to uh, Deputy Reed and MLK staff. Senior station opened last summer, former fire station. Community spay and neuter program kicked off, thanks to Tyler and the animal shelter team. Purple Heart City uh, became official this year. And we kicked off the 150th birthday celebration of Muskogee in January, and that will continue the year-long celebration through December. Bird Scooters arrived as our first scooter program in Muskogee in January. They plan to expand beyond downtown soon. Trafera moved in to the old armory on the airport property. They're doing very well. And then we have Blue Peak, the new fiber company in town, in the early stages of their pre-construction. Finally, St. Francis was another large announcement uh, planning their expansion on their campus. And finally, the, uh, you know, it wouldn't be Oklahoma without some winter weather and flooding. So a lot of time and effort responding to those events this year. Thank you again to the council for supporting the current fiscal year projects. And we'll get into next year's uh, budget principles and some of the highlights. <coughs> As always, we budget conservatively with expenses lower than revenue, budget for good surprises, which is what Mr. Miller would call our uh, reserve fund, and then using the strategic initiatives from the council as our guiding principles. The mid-year budget review is very important. We do that in December to make any necessary adjustments with the reserve fund. OMAG calls our policy the best in the state. Many uh, cities around the state model theirs after ours. It's kind of thought of as a savings account. Of course, we all can't anticipate our, all emergencies that may happen during the year, but we do save and uh, try to prepare for this. Little history on the reserve fund. It started in 2018, went through a few modifications until 2019. The goal is to have the reserve fund at 20% or higher. The ordinance designating the best practice um, does encourage a 20% as our minimum, which is our goal to reach each year and continue building it in each successive year. Carry forward is used, it's kind of a breakdown, but 75% of carry forward each year for surplus is applied towards the reserve. The other 25% is what's used for this one time expenses we call the special project fund. The timeline for that special project funding is currently reviewed in the <coughs> fall. So we'll be coming back to you in a few months after we close out the current fiscal year. Then the special projects are discussed and the budget amendment, if needed, is done in December. Reserve fund status, the last few years, continues being really close to 20%. This year is about 17%. We've discussed that breakdown previously. We're at about 6.2 million for that account after uh, expenses and the mid-year allocation. And circling back to the strategic council initiatives, uh, we discussed these again in the council retreat. Uh, many of our funding uh, projects and decisions were based on these priorities this year. So obviously streets and infrastructure is still a big focus. 
public image, economic development, housing, and tourism. So just a few highlights under each of those street projects we've already talked about, uh, widening projects, water line replacements and repairs, um, water leak repair budget, stormwater projects, we'll be continuing those, um, doing engineering for Eagle Crest, North Country Club, Smith Ferry Road, and then working on drainage plan implementation steps. Public image continues. Uh, we rolled out the new first ever Muskogee City logo, community cleanup and demolition and additional mowing was also budgeted this year. Economic development is continuing to be a focus of the MRA. We already talked about a few highlights from private businesses in town. Housing is also tied to the economic development initiative. Uh, the council continues discussing incentives and possible programming for enticing builders to come uh, to Muskogee. Tourism continues uh, to do well. We've got the 150th anniversary, as we said earlier, continuing. Depot Green is continuing their programming downtown. Hatbox has seen improvements this year, both in the uh, event center side as well as the sports complex. <coughs> that photo, uh, for those who can't tell, it's the parking lot being worked on next to the event center. And then finally, one of the bonus, I call it the bonus initiative, employee morale. We were able to do wage increases for cost of living in July, which we are proposing again for next fiscal year as well as the second round of the pandemic stipend in December, like we did this year. We'll continue the food baskets and holiday event for employees as well. Okay, getting into next year's budget overview. Each of these funds are detailed, again, like I said, in the packet and online. General fund revenues and expenses are expected to go up about $2 million, so 38 million for general fund. Special revenue and capital project funds add up to about 39 million. Enterprise funds, internal service funds, and sinking funds round out that list. And all of these add up to about 90.6 million. Again, our Guiding principles putting together the budget is to be conservative on proposed revenues and balance the expenses with proposed revenues. We all know sales tax um, is a very difficult way to budget for city operations in Oklahoma, but that is what we are stuck with. So we do our best to um, predict that future and it has, it seems like it changes week to week on sales tax and all the current events affecting um, both shopping and prices such as fuel going up. Just a few uh, notes on next year's general fund revenue assumptions. We're projecting about 7% in sales tax growth and 6% in use tax growth conservative projections on other revenue. We have 21 revenue accounts total, and that would be fines and charges for services and all the various revenues. Expenses, uh, we've discussed uh, all the different environmental things we can't control, fuel, utilities, and consumables. So we are doing our best to um, project the uh, expenses for each department based on uh, next year's general fund. Number of employees is staying flat. There's not currently any new positions for next year. Um, this is our biggest expense, and I would say our biggest asset is our, is our team members. 71% makes up the general fund.
As I said, the external factors continue affecting our expense projections, but we are still doing well ending this fiscal year and using um, how we look ending up this fiscal year to project next fiscal year. Capital outlay, <clears throat> excuse me, has 2.5 million plus the dedicated sales tax funds for next year. We have some rolling projects that are building up the funding, such as our fuel system. <coughs> we'll continue funding our facilities budget for small capital projects, various uh, vehicles and street equipment and downtown maintenance for sidewalks. There's various dedicated capital outlay sales tax accounts. One of them is fire, one of them is police. Police will be receiving their Bearcat um, this month. And then fire continues to um, set aside funds for their new station. Next year's MMA uh, budget has 17.8 million, including capital and various funds for street cuts, water leaks, and sewer repairs. Street budget, again, is one of the largest in history. Um, 24th Street continues its progress, and then the Northwest Zone, uh, like I said, will kick off this year. On the map, it shows that's west of Main Street and north of Old Mulgee. Mike can correct me if I'm wrong. <laughs> okay. So next steps, that wraps up the presentation. We'll take any comments from council or questions or the audience. Um, public hearing is tonight. Council adoption is scheduled to be next Monday night. If there's no other questions or concerns, then we begin the fiscal year July 1st. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Ms. Sweezy. We don't have any residents having signed up to speak to this item tonight, so we will close the public hearing. Uh, as this is a public hearing for public consumption uh, uh, purposes, as Ms. Sweezy has stated, uh, we will formally make adoption or corrections as necessary during our next, at the end of our next hearing. But for tonight, do we have any questions from the members of the council concerning tonight's presentation? I do have a couple of questions and points. Um, first of all, to uh, I guess the city attorney, should we not be concerned about uh, pending lawsuits that may have to be paid out in the coming year? Uh, whenever we receive a final judgment in that uh, is when we put it on the sinking fund, not before. And so since we don't have that amount yet, because there's still a lot of things to be determined, um, there is already some dispute about how interest is collected, uh, plus we have attorney's fees. Uh, and so when those numbers become known is when we can incorporate those into the sinking fund. Thank you. I was just concerned if there oh, was something good, that no, great question. should be discussed at budget time. <clears throat> and uh, uh, Deputy Mayor, let me, let me mention one other thing. I did have a conversation with the uh, county assessor as well and uh, mentioned to him uh, kind of what the, the county's uh, timeline is because, you know, they do collect our sinking fund. And so um, if there is uh, some information that becomes known to us before the adoption of their budget and their fiscal year is 10-1 uh, to 9-30, so they're on an October, September. If we know it uh, before then, then we can do a budget amendment to incorporate that at that time, just to give you a more full answer. All right. And, you know, not to be negative and stuck on lawsuits, also where are we at as far as uh, the mall situation? Uh, there was a discussion this week, you know, when are we going to ever get to the settlement or, you know, any type of conversation on, on the mall status? There is nothing that I can talk to you about right now that would impact the sinking fund on that. Thank you. And then my final uh, question, I saw that we had a uh, mention of the fire station. Did we have, have we selected a location for that and how far in the plans are we on uh, the fire station that we're budgeting for for this year? Um, the current location is still the... Um, chosen location for the replacement of the station. So we have received a site plan back from the architect and then once we have the uh, funding plan in place for the construction is when we'll move on to the next design step. So rebuild it in the, in the York Street location? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes. Those are all the questions I have, Mayor. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Any other questions on that item? 
Uh, yes, uh, Mr. Mayor. Yes, ma'am. Uh, in our uh, side lunchings, we talked about the different departments asking for uh, increases. Uh, we didn't get the numbers in time, so is this reflected in here or did they remain flat? What are we doing there? Are you referring to wages? Um, I'm referring to uh, the, um, say, uh, Civic Center. I'm referring to tourism asking for what they asked for. Those were the list. So were we there? <clears throat> um, each of the uh, discussions and the lunches, we summarized that afterwards. And um, the ones that were approved, I think, and Dennis may be able to help me uh, recall, the MLK Center received their funding and then um, increase as you all approved that Monday night and then I believe most of the others stayed flat from current year everybody stayed flat um, we gave the transit a 4.2 percent increase to about 159,000 uh, everybody else as of right now has stayed flat and that was based on discussion of seeing how the first few months of the fiscal year go before doing increases. Thank you. What Thank you, Mr. McGee. Mr. Mayor, very recognized. Yes, Mr. Mayor. What, what did the King Center end up with? I believe that was a $25,000 increase. I thought it was supposed to be more than that. Yeah, well, I think we were, we, we approved that first 25 and then it was supposed to be, a, that we were gonna increase it another 25 was the direction during lunches. Do we know if we added the second 25 back in? I'll double check. I don't think so. I'm happy to, happy to do that this week if that's the feedback. Because, I, I mean, that was, I mean, in the luncheon, that was, a, at least the luncheon I went to, that was the agreement to raise it. <coughs> Another 25? I believe it was. Mm -hmm. Or more. Okay. <coughs> I'll double check. But if it's not, I'll make that change. And tourism is going to be the same? Mm -hmm. Tourism was the um, different event discussion doing the uh, 150th and rodeo funding in-house and then um, approaching the request on the visitor center funding in a few months. So I'm sorry, I'm just trying to make sure I understand you. So did we give the tourism the money for the events? The current... Uh, your budget, what they asked for, will continue. But we next didn't give. We didn't give. Did we or did we not give them the increase for the? That events? was going to stay for the for in house on in the special events funding that the committee has within the city budget for for the 150th birthday. So instead of going through tourism, it's staying in the special events funding. Okay, I'll get that. Other questions? Thank you, Ms. Weezy and staff uh, for your presentations on tonight. Thank you, Council, for your questions. Again, uh, we will have follow-up conversations during the week based on those questions, and next Monday night I'll have further explanation and whatever amendments to the presentation is necessary. Item number two. Discuss, <coughs> excuse me, discuss and take action to allocate additional financial resources to the Muskogee Police Department to aid in preparing for and responding to potential active shooter situations. Thank you to the uh, council and members present on tonight. Uh, before I go into the several interrelated presentations that we have, we do have one resident signed up to speak to us on this item tonight. Uh, Melody Cranford, I'm gonna ask if you come to the uh, microphone and give us your name and your address. Uh, and your presentation and you have five minutes okay. thank you the glass down so I can see here I'm Melody Cranford my address is 1102 Meadow Lane Drive Muskogee Oklahoma and I am standing to speak um, to the agenda item for the increase for Muskogee PD First of all, I would like to say as being out there in the middle of Taft while that happened, I wanna thank the Sheriff's Department, Muskogee PD, IMSA, everybody that showed up as first responders. And um, I would like to address part of this funding and I'm hoping that um, you all agree with me that portions of this funding would go to 
crisis preparedness and response for civilians. Because what I witnessed there was um, civilians that kind of got in the way and hindered some of the uh, first responder responses in timely manners. And so I think that um, we need some civilian training as well. So if some funds could be allotted, um, I've given you a presentation you have there. It's the alert, A-L-E-R-R-T. Everybody should have that. Um, one of the ways that I was able to assist is because I had been ALICE trained through um, being an educator. So part of your professional development as an educator, you go through what's called ALICE training. It stands for alert, lockdown, inform, counter, and evacuate. And um, having that training, I was able to assist uh, citizens who were injured. During that time, I was able to get children out of the way. Um, some of the young people that were there that are scholars of mine, they were able to hear my voice over the crowd because we have been trained in lockdown simulations at our school. And so I think that it helped a lot of young people stay safe and we didn't have as many fatalities of young people as we could have seen with those bullets right there in the area where they had designated for young people to play. So my first question is, what are best practices to take into consideration when there is an armed assailant? What should civilians do? Get out of the way if you are not trained to respond. We had nurses there that were trying to respond. We had family members saying, that's my family member. They were literally pulling the hair of the nurses who were trying to respond. You know, when the nurses were saying, I am an RN and, and identifying themselves. So civilians need to know how to not panic and I think that a lot of these things um, could have been uh, resolved in a more timely manner if they had just gotten out of the way. We had victims who were put in vehicles and I just jumped out of my vehicle and kind of directed traffic and was like, okay, turn your hazard lights on, take your windows down, get your arms out. So those types of things that civilians could do to help because we knew that IMSA was coming, but it was not there at the time. So get out of the way, get all the traffic out of the way, kind of be responsible as citizens to know to get out, move away. You can't leave because you know that these um, response vehicles are coming from Muskogee. So why would you try to travel down the highway and get in the way of that? And so I think that um, those are some things that we really need to work on. Maybe some simulations of shootings. And I know that you will read where they say it, it's traumatizing, but it helped us. It helped the young people that were out there that are at school today saying, thank you for helping us. And we remember what to do. And when I was out there, I was able to say to some of those young people, you did what you learned and you did a good job. And that kind of helped them get over the trauma. Um, also, um, off duty responders, first responders, how do you assist? And then once the on duty responders are there, relinquish that responsibility, give them some mini kind of report to know what has happened, what you've done to those victims and know how to just move out of the way once they are in place. And um, then what supports um, are needed to assist uh, small communities that don't have these resources. So how are we gonna help cities like Taft who don't have these resources? Will they be able, and I'm gonna debrief with um, Sheriff Simmons tomorrow, will they be allowed in some of these trainings? So you have this training, um, it is, and you can see on your first page, um, the alert advanced law enforcement rapid response training. And on the back, you can see where they have the craze, which is civilian response to active shooter events. And it is also, um, I read here, and I don't know, we could kind of research this and figure it out, adopted by our state already. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any questions for Ms. Cranford on tonight? Thank you, Ms. Cranford, so Thank much. You. We'll be certain to uh, find ways to share this information as we move forward with our training. Thank you. Members of the council, item number two was uh, my agenda item, and I'm ready to make my presentation at this time. 
Uh, but before we go into that presentation, let us pray. Lord, we thank you for tonight. As I always say before I stand before your people, with all reverence and fear for being in my flesh, hijack my words, take charge that whatever the outcome is may be good for your people. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We stand on the precipice of being prepared to assist the community in the event of an active shooter or continue to believe or hope that it will never happen in green country. In the last three weeks, we have learned one thing. It is better to be prepared and not need to respond than to have to respond and be unprepared. What I will be asking tonight is to prepare a law, our law enforcement, for what may be the inevitable event of an active shooter event in the city of Muskogee. What happened in Taft, Oklahoma, can very well happen in Muskogee, USA. What happened at St. Francis Healthcare Systems in Tulsa, Oklahoma, can very well happen at St. Francis Healthcare Systems in Muskogee. The time for us to act as proactive as we can is now. Schools, churches, hospitals, family gatherings, parks, funeral homes, after school programs, nurseries, or even nursing homes are soft targets that provide the most vulnerable in our communities the opportunity to be attacked. Mayors across the country and here in Oklahoma want to be prepared because the lost lives of the victims, directly or indirectly, speak to the need for being prepared now. The good people of Uvalde, Texas, are caught up in a whirlwind of questions as to why the active shooter was allowed to advance as well as he did. Who did or didn't do what was necessary to stop him? And what can be done going forward to prevent another mass shooting in a school? We are obligated in green country, in Muskogee, USA, to be sure that as we move our community forward, we are as prepared as possible to respond and mitigate any and all active shooter threats. Children are dead. Teachers and faculty are dead. In Tulsa, Oklahoma, physicians, staff, and patients are dead. In neighboring Taft, a young mother is dead whose daughter goes into the summer months without her mother. <clears throat> Rising tide lifts all ships, and as we prepare to protect Muskogee, we are also prepared to assist smaller surrounding communities in our county in their times of threat. We need to allocate funding now to prepare our law enforcement community for a threat that is spreading across the country to the magnitude of virus and disease. What our law enforcement has to work with is inadequate at best. The Muskogee Special Operations Team, or SWAT, has minimum equipment to respond to an active shooter incident. But even worse, the police officers on patrol, who will likely be the first to respond to an active shooter incident, do not have the proper equipment at all. The rifles they were issued, or have in their possession, were issued in 1978 and are considered a Vietnam era <coughs> weapon. The vests they wear are adequate for the times of cops and robbers where the bad guys carried pistols or handguns but cannot defend against heavy artillery machinery. None of us want to stand before the public in an event of an active shooter incident in Muskogee and say we wish we would have done when we could have done it better. So the time to act is now. Let me be clear. The best we can do is to be prepared in the event of an active shooter incident in our city. I hope it never happens. But the last three weeks have taught us that no city, no environment, no individual is off limits when it comes to the depth of damage, destruction, and death that can be caused by an active shooter. What is it that I think we need to do? Number one, we need to acquire an active shooter training kit to properly prepare our law enforcement personnel 
to enter an active shooting environment pre and post scenario. That kit will properly train up to 30 law enforcement officers at a time. The cost of that kit is $50,000. Number two, the existing Vietnam era rifles must be decommissioned as soon as possible and replaced with the proper emergency response equipment. That cost is $122,500 and equips all of our officers with what they need to save lives. Number three, the cost of the accompanying rifle place, plates and carriers that we may refer to as vests is $49,000. After Deputy Chief Farmer is done providing further commentary on what we need, I will be back to stand before the body and ask for the following motion to be approved. That motion will be to move an allocation of $222,000 in additional resources to aid in preparing for and responding to potential active shooter situations and further to authorize and direct the interim city manager to identify the sources of funding for the allocation and to approve all necessary line item or fund to fund transfers uh, as may be required. At this time, I'm going to ask Deputy Chief Farmer to give us further necessary commentary on this request. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Mayor. Council. Um, let me first start. Um, we are certified. We have instructors in ALERT. The entire department's been taught in ALERT, like uh, she was talking about a while ago. We've also taught over 150 classes of the craze. It may not be out there that we do that, um, but we are open to that, and our schedule is full now. Obviously, our phones have blown up uh, for people wanting that instruction, so we're here for that. Um, what we want to show you, show them the so Captain Dean is wearing an exterior vest carrier that you'll see some of the officers wearing. Uh, the other is a Class A that's just a uniform shirt. Both of them have this body armor in it. It stops our pistol rounds, um, most all pistol rounds. It's light. Um, obviously, you don't want to carry something real heavy all day when you're out in the heat, but that's the bare minimum protection. The rifle plates, like what the mayor was talking about, are laying over here. There's a front and a back plate um, that actually stop rifle rounds like it have been used in these shootings. Um, they're putting a carrier that looks similar to this one. This is a little bulkier than what we're asking asking for. Uh, but this is an SOT vest that, that all the team is wearing now. And they have the actual plate in it, and it's Kevlar. So what we're asking for and what the mayor was talking about is a regular patrol officer would show up with that um, body armor over here. They would throw a carrier on that's got these plates in it, and then they would have enough protection for a rifle round. That's the $700, about $700 an officer. And not counting SOT, because they've already got it, that would be about 70 officers we'd have to um, fund for. The picture I gave you that was laying up there, uh, the top one is the, the Vietnam era rifle that the mayor was talking about. We got those government surplus, and we got those 10 years ago. Um, they were from Anniston, Alabama. We drove and picked those up really cheap. They were still in the box. They're brand new, but they're actual M16s. They're fully automatic. Uh, we have converted those to semi because we didn't want a fully automatic weapon out there, but that took some money and some time to, to do that. So when you're entering a school or a building or something like that with that really long gun, it, it does not work very well trying to round corners and dealing with the people and all that. Also, you'll notice there's no place to attach a flashlight. So every one of these school shootings and stuff, the power goes out, the alarms are going off, there's smoke, they're gonna need a flashlight. So you can't adequately carry that rifle and a flashlight at the same time. A lot of people ask, why do you need a rifle? Well, one, we're getting shot at with rifles. Um, the other two is, you know, we're getting shot at with a pistol. We're gonna need a rifle to shoot back because we can engage that suspect from a further distance. That rifle is a whole lot more accurate than a pistol is, um, which means we're shooting less rounds and we're putting rounds on target um, better. Um, so that second picture or the, the rifle underneath that top one is what the current SOT rifle looks like, which is what we're asking for. Um, it comes complete with the, the optic on it for better accuracy. It's shorter, comes with a sling and a light, um, so you won't have to buy any other attachments. But those are about $1,700 a piece. Um, I think that covered all the, the equipment. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. 
Oh, training kit. The training kit is uh, the alert training kit that we used to have to borrow from Cleet. Uh, Cleet does not offer that anymore. That's why we um, need to buy our own. It's a kit that will continue for many years. It's got 20 actual Glock pistols in it that shoot simulation rounds. Uh, so we don't uh, have to use our own, our own weapons. Um, comes with all the protective gear, comes with all the instructions and training manuals and all that. Um, but we can do 30 in a class and we can teach that class from now on with that, with that equipment. We're going to open that up to all the surrounding agencies and uh, EMS and fire. So we'll try to train all together. We're planning on doing that before all this happened this summer anyway. Um, we just weren't going to be able to do that big a class because we don't have that whole kit with us. But um, this kind of sped things up a little bit. Here's a question. How often do you yes, guys get shot at? Well, I've been three times in my career. Um, it just depends. Um, we're, we get in a couple of shootings a year, knock on some wood. We haven't had one in a little bit, um, but it happens quite a bit, more than people think. Thank you. I got a question. Mr. Yes, Mayor, I recognize. Yes, sir. I was just curious. I'm used to watching SWAT. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and, <laughs> that gun right there, I see when they have the lights when they're going in. Yes, sir. How about your helmet? SWAT, SWAT, SWAT has helmets. We, I mean, I'll, you want to buy me a helmet, put in every car, I'll be more than happy to take it. But we're <laughs> trying to get by with the minimum amount that we can get by with. I've got about another, what, $300,000 I could ask for. Um, but we felt like this was the minimum we could get by with to do what we needed to do. I know you can get shot in the head just as well as you can. Absolutely. And those vests right there? Yes, sir. And these assault weapons here, I guess they call them. So I don't know much about it. So it's a two, two, three round. It's a rifle round. Uh -huh. that, that vest right there will stop that. This one. Not okay. the ones that we wear every day. It's the two, two, three at the bottom? They both are. They both are. They okay. both shoot the same round. Oh, okay. Yeah. You got any guns that won't, that will go through that? Out there on the streets? Oh, yeah. Yeah. The, this, this new one we're wanting? Yeah. Yeah, there are. Uh, there's not very many of those out there, but there are. Yeah. Most of the things when we go into shootings here, there's 762, which is the Russian round, the AK-47, and 223, which is these rifles here. Um, that's that's usually what we encounter when we go to a shooting in town. I'm sorry, I just don't know. No, you're fine. Yeah, I know it's. I'm throwing a lot of numbers out there, but bigger bullet with a rifle, obviously, more powder behind it, so it goes faster. It's actually a small bullet on a two, two, three, but it's got a lot of powder behind it, so it goes faster and it'll cut right through that armor. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you, Paul. Yep, you bet. Mr. Mayor, might be recognized. Yes. <clears throat> are these <coughs> the uh, the weapons we have now? Are they can they break down with the the lower end and the barrel? Does all of that still break down? What, what do you mean? That's can, can, can the above weapon be broken down and rebuilt? So I can't, the top weapon is a government issued uh, surplus. We can't alter that to that extent. I can take that sear out, which made it, took it from an M16 to an AR, made it semi-auto, but I can't start taking all those parts off because it's a surplus weapon. So when we get rid of those, I've got to give it back to the government. The, the, the core of both of these weapons are basically the same. Yes, sir. It's the stocks and the barrels. A lot of it, yes. Can we bring in stocks and barrels and retrofit? I, I build a lot of these type of things. And <laughs> no, I, yeah, I, I know maybe, what you're saying. We we've, we've tried. There's so much. That, <laughs> there's only so much we can do to the weapon to to alter it for the government when we got it for surplus. We can't just rebuild it. <laughs> okay, so yeah. they basically have yeah. rules on what you yes, can sir. and can't do with that. Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Mr. Mayor, can I <clears throat> just add an, an additional to uh, your motion uh, in response to what Ms. Cranford stated? I think it is important that if we could set aside, Chad, some, some time a day with several different sessions to allow anybody in the public to come and get some training. <clears throat> My staff uh, this past Wednesday, um, we trained all of our night hoop staff, our summer learning staff, our community treasure staff, as well as our King Center staff. You know, coincidentally, while we were in training, the event happened in Tulsa, and it's, it kind of gave our staff, uh, you know, a sense of easement, knowing that we uh, are have you know some kind of directives of, on what to do. And I think it would be important if we can add to that that motion to have some kind of public forums to where uh, we can have some civilian training as well as. Uh, you know, several sessions to be able to accommodate, 
different uh, outside groups uh, in addition, you know, I think it's great that what we're doing for, for you guys to protect us, but also to help the citizens be aware as well. Yeah, we can absolutely do that. So we, we've been all over Tulsa and Eastern Oklahoma teaching that, including here. Um, we even had a company fly a couple of them to Denver, and we taught up there. That's how well they do at, at teaching the class. So I uh, talked to Deputy Mayor earlier. Typically what happens is we'll take you around the building and show you what to do in that building that you're in. The events the other night kept us from that. we got to go back and follow up with him on that piece. But um, typically the class, here's what to do, here's how to handle it, but also here's your, you know, if somebody comes in that door, here's what to do and how to how to address that. So uh, let's, let's get there. We'll let's get the arena. That. Let's have, let's get the arena and have a thousand member class. <laughs> All right, let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> you hear that, Chris? Okay. <laughs> he did a great job Wednesday as well. Mr. Mayor, might be recognized. Yes. So I know that uh, one of our public school systems, Hilldale, they do have armed officers. Uh, that's Muskogee PD. Is there any conversation with Muskogee Public Schools and uh, Muskogee PD co-op? And is there any conversation being brought up at all to have armed officers at our other schools? We haven't talked to Muskogee about putting people there. We have trained with them in the alert stuff as far as the response, but not, not actually putting people in the buildings, no. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Deputy Chief Former, Mr. Tucker. Uh, will you assist my motion to be certain that we include uh, providing uh, whatever necessary resources to our uh, trainers and facilitators of the law enforcement to include the proper training and mass for uh, uh, community organizations and members of the public? So I think what the additional clause to your motion, Mayor, would be to uh, add and further to direct staff to incorporate a public component for, civili for civilian training um, for the community, uh, for community organizations and the public at large. Is Council clear on the motion as amended? Second. Uh, I'll go through it. Thank you. Got okay. Do we have a motion and a second first? Good. Okay. Uh, the motion would be to move to approve an allocation of 225000 $220,000 in additional resources to aid in preparing for and responding to potential active shooter situations and further to authorize and direct the interim city manager to identify the sources of funding for the allocation and to approve all necessary line item or fund to fund transfers as may be required and further to direct staff to incorporate a public component for civilian training for community organizations and the public at large. Mr. Tucker, I think it's uh, 222000 Okay. That's my motion. A second. We have a motion and a second on that item. Any further discussion? Roll you, call. Oh. You know, I remember might be recognized, Mayor. Yes, sir. I remember, and y'all, you, you were on the council too, and Councilman Reed here, when we debated and debated about trying to get some security. You remember that? Mm -hmm. Years ago. So now I'm glad we went, we've got things in place. Can't say exactly what they all are, but I'm glad we went that route because you know we fought for it. And so I feel more safe sitting right here in this desk right now than I did back then. But I got a lot of slack back then. Oh, no, no, no. But we finally said, yes, yes, yes. Thank God that we did. And I just, it's, you know, our world now is just, I don't know. What's, what's wrong with people? How they think could go in and kill people just like that, like that, nobody. So I agree with you, Mayor. I mean, we need stuff. I'll turn the floor back over to you. Thank you, Mr. Van. We have a motion and a second. Roll call. Shirley Hilton Flannery? Yes. Tracy Hoos? Yes. <clears throat> Tracy McGee? Yes. Alex Reynolds? Yes. Jamie Stout? Yes. Ivory Van? Yes. Deputy Mayor Jarek Reed? Yes. Mayor Marlon Coleman? Yes. The <clears throat> item passes. That will conclude the special call agenda item. Call to order the Finance Committee meeting for June the 6th, 2022. <clears throat> item number one, please. Consider approval of Finance Committee minutes of May 2nd, 2022, or take other necessary action. Reviewing of the minutes, are there any corrections or additions to our minutes? Move for approval. Second it. I have a motion and a second to approve our minutes. Any discussion? 
Roll call, please. Shirley Hilton Flannery? Yes. Tracy Hoos? Yes. Tracy McGee? Yes. Alex Reynolds? Yes. Jamie Stout? Yes. Ivory Van? Yes. Deputy Mayor Derek Reed? Yes. Mayor Marlon Coleman? Yes. <coughs> Item number one passes. Item number two, please. Consider approval of claims for all city departments April 23rd, 2022 through May 27th, 2022, or take other necessary action. Do we have a report from the Purchasing Committee? Yes, the Purchasing Committee did meet this afternoon and we approved the claims. I move for approval. Second. We have a motion and a second to approve our claims. Any discussion? Roll call, please. Shirley Hilton Flannery? Yes. Tracy Hoos? Yes. Tracy McGee? Yes. Alex Reynolds? Yes. Jamie Stout? Yes. Ivory Van? Yes. Deputy Mayor Derek Reed? Yes. Mayor Marlon Coleman? Yes. Item number two passes. Item number three, please. Consider approval of ordinance number 4162A, amending the City of Muskogee Code of Ordinances, Chapter 42, Fire Prevention and Protection, Article 3, Fire Services, by adding Section 42-53, Special Event Fire Apparatus, adding repealer severability and declaring an emergency or take other necessary action. Chief Moore. Good evening, uh, members of council. Um, as it states in the background, uh, more often MFD has requested, has been requested to attend remain on site at special events. Um, similar to what EMS does, we'd like to create a, a charge for such service. Um, our equipment is setting idling most of the time, utilizing fuel, um, as well as wear and tear on that, those items. So over time, obviously it's a cost that we incur upon ourselves and our budget. So we would like to, Propose a fee that would come at a three hour minimum and would uh, be dependent upon, upon the type of apparatus that has re been requested by the event uh, organizer. Uh, I believe you guys in your packet have the uh, schedule for, for charges uh, dependent on the apparatus requested. And we do recommend approval and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, any questions for the chief? Move for approval. Second it. We have a motion and a second to approve this agenda item. Any further discussion? Mr. Chairman, one thing I want to clarify. Um, the uh, ordinance that is being asked to be approved is the one that was distributed. Uh, there is a correction that references that this charge is for private events, not public events. Absolutely. So we wanted to clarify that uh, in the ordinance. Otherwise, everything is the same. Thank you. Roll call, please. Shirley Hilton Flannery? Yes. Tracy Hoos? Yes. Tracy McGee? Yes. Alex Reynolds? Yes. Jamie Stout? Yes. Ivory Van? Yes. Deputy Mayor Derek Reed? Yes. Mayor Marlon Coleman? Yes. <coughs> item number three passes. Item number four, please. We have an emergency. Not on committee. Okay. Consider approval of resolution number 2901, adopting amendment to Appendix A of the Muskogee City Code pertaining to schedule of fees and charges per attached list, special event fee for fire apparatus, or take other necessary action. Chief Moore. <clears throat> Again, just uh, in your packet, that's what we propose for each apparatus. Um, defining engine company, rescue company, Ladder company, our fire boat, as well as our brush truck. Pay for approval. Second. We have a motion and a second to approve this item. Any further discussion? Roll call, please. Shirley Hilton Flannery? Yes. Tracy Hoos? Yes. Tracy McGee? Yes. Alex Reynolds? Yes. Jamie Stout? Yes. Ivory Van? Yes. Deputy Mayor Derek Reed? Yes. Mayor Marlon Coleman? Yes. Item number four passes. Okay. Item number five, please. Consider approval of the cooperative agreement between the City of Muskogee and Neighbors Building Neighborhoods for the purpose of applying for grants and grant activities on behalf of the City and other not-for-profit activities that enhance the economic well-being of the Muskogee community, as well as receive a report from Kim Lynch, Executive Director, or take other necessary action. Mr. Tucker. Uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the uh, committee, this is a renewal of the existing contract that the city enjoys with Neighbors Building Neighborhoods. Uh, this provides us with grant writing services and also uh, some additional funding to do uh, good projects such as the uh, uh, neighbor, uh, the neighborhood night out. 
neighborhood night out um, and so this is the uh, just a renewal there have not been any changes to this agreement um, the one that was attached in your packet uh, was an older version so the new, the current version is the one that I distributed to you okay. so this is uh, what we're asking for approval um, and then with that I'm happy to answer any questions on the agreement uh, but uh, I know Miss Lynch has some things that she wants to tell dog us about. The dog and pony show. The yes. dog and pony show, <laughs> yes, that she wants to tell us about uh, neighbors building neighborhoods over the past year. Thank so, Kim. Well, thank you, Mr. Tucker. Um, first, if you look in your water bill, this happens this weekend, so that's most important to tell you that it's the prevention take back, um, the prescription take back, and that is gone through uh, one of our prevention grants, which I'll talk to you. You also have in your packet more things than you ever wanted to know about, but I'm going to still share. Um, our annual report, I think we've already given it to you once, but we can go through it again. Easy reading, how's that? The long sheet that's behind that are grants that have been written, teeny tiny writing, and that's $45 million pending on grants. Um, probably the, the two or the three besides the ARPA funds, um, one was, has been declined, and that was the Muskogee Police Department. The, uh, the Muskogee Fire Department, the AFG grant, is still pending, and it looks fairly good as far as we've, we've heard. We haven't heard anything, anything different from that. And then we have a U.S. DOJ um, that was submitted April 26 with the Muskogee, um, and that's the Blue Line Wellness, and that's with... Um, and is Chad still here? Yes. Yeah. It's. Um, I'm sorry. I have a bad back, so I'm. I'm kind of standing, kind of awkward. Um, but that is the the social wellness and um, some mental health on that grant. And um, sometime when, when after we get it, because we've already received it once, um, I'd love Chad to talk to you about the mental health of that and, and what was the positive parts of that. So that's the the grant writing so far. The next one is with these blue lines, just so that you know, those 26 are the first, the MBN programs, those 26 programs are all grants that we receive. So we, just to give you an idea of what we actually do, the back office is the 21 numbers below that. The back part of that is pass-through grants, which is 11 of them. As far as NBN, just to note that we have a payroll of 1.1 million and that's during a pandemic. Usually we run about a million and a half to two million dollars. A lot of people, huh? For that, the, the following one is our, our profit and loss for last year, just to give you an in idea of our income. If you look on the income of the city of Muskogee on 15,000, you actually give us 30, but our grant, our fiscal year is different than your fiscal year. So that's why that's that difference. The next sheet, I'm trying to get through this. Deputy Mayor will probably be cheerleading really hard on this, but the Dream Team, the Night Hoops has started. Um, great success, lots of kids, they're happy they're there. We had four um, police officers there to help with security. We desperately need lights, Let's look at you. And um, the lights on the new parking lot, which thank you very much for that. Um, but it's dark now and we have kids in the dark, so that's the next set, step to go forward. Um, I've also visited with Tim Thompson, so we can get some help with that. But that's happening for, in June and July. There's eight weeks of it, skipping Juneteenth and July 4th weekend, so those will not be happening. The last big heavy sheet is next week, the Hope Through Healing. That's in partnership with Fostering Hope Kids Space and Restoration Behavioral Health. That's on the 16th, I think we have 40 slots left out of 200. So if you're dragging your feet, please get there. There is a little bit of scholarship money if you need to do that. Um, it's an amazing project, um, especially in this day and age. You know, very, very important. It doesn't have to be just for law enforcement or mental health professionals. We have lots of students there. We have teachers there. We have just everyday folks that want to learn more about um, the trauma-informed community efforts that are happening. So that's very, very important to share. I have run through this really fast. If you have any questions, I'll be glad to, to answer them. Um, we are thrilled to be a part of the, the community. We've always been that. And I'll answer any questions. 
Any questions for Ms. Lynch? Yeah, Mr. Chair, may I be recognized? Yes. Ms. Lynch, I got a call been two weeks ago, and uh, this lady called me, and this older couple, their house is falling in around them. The floor, you can see the you can dirt in the, you know, in the floor. And I'm, I'm just wondering, we tried to call some of the apartments. We got two apartment complexes downtown. They're both full. K. Frank Manor, both full. And a lot of times these apartments and stuff, you have to be on their list. So here in Muskogee, if we don't realize it or not, if we have a situation with an older person like that, we're in kind of a, in trouble. We in, well, I ain't going to say kind of, we're in trouble. And I was just wondering, is there any programs that anybody up here at council or anybody up here know about here in Muskogee that next time somebody called me like that, I can refer them to them? Because the, the lady ended up, finally someone uh, in her family took her to Norman. But for our older citizens, we don't have nothing for them. I mean, if they're just, they're out there. The two things that I would immediately go to is Blake Ferris with the Housing Authority and see if they're eligible to be in that. If they're not, there's Kai Boys in town that does some community advocacy for some housing. They help with um, utilities. They may be able to. There's a really good men's group at First Baptist Church, and I know that there are other churches that are involved that will come in and assist for, for ramps and things like that. That may be somebody who could have helped with the flooring. Habitat for Humanity is also in place. Um, they have not built in several years, but are trying to shore themselves up. I know about Cowboys, the one on Fifth Street, they take care of people's facilities. The one down on Broadway, they, uh, for, like for veterans, they have veterans, but I don't know about just for regular. I'm not sure. I don't think so. I, don't, I, I, don't, I believe Cowboys is veterans only. Yeah, okay. So that not- One of their grants is for veterans only. They, they are statewide or at least Northeast Oklahoma wide, so they have some very different grants in, in Other different than communities. Veterans? Yes. Um, the other person that you might do is, is visit with the EEOD. EEOD, yes. Um, and Stacy Turner. She works with senior citizens, and that might be a person that you can visit with. Okay. I didn't, I didn't I've given you four. I, you know, quick off my head. Okay. But those, those four could be possibilities. Now, Mr. Uh, Blake, I know he's over the Muskogee Housing, but mm -hmm. that's another one where you've got to be on the a list. Yes. And that's that's hard to get somebody in a house overnight on a list. Yes. That's what I'm saying, you know. Cool. I was just wondering, you know, if anybody knew of anything else. When um, Tyler is behind me, Tyler Evans, and he's part of the MCDRC, and when we had the flood, uh -huh. you know, a lot of that was taking care of neighbors building neighborhoods, held that money for, for the flood victims, and did a lot of work for that. Um, we don't usually help individuals. That's not really what our role is. Our role is to help the organizations to get there. Um, I'll try. You know, you can send it to me and we can see what we can do. Thank you, Ms. Lynch. Uh -huh. I'll turn the floor back over to you, Deputy Mayor. Thank you. Any additional questions for Ms. Lynch or do we have a motion? Move for approval. I'll second it. I have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Roll call, please. Shirley Hilton Flannery. Yes. Tracy Hoos. Yes. Tracy McGee. Yes. Alex Reynolds. Yes. Jamie Stout. Yes. Ivory Van. Yes. <coughs> Deputy Mayor Jarek Reed. Yes. Mayor Marlon Coleman. Yes. <coughs> item number five passes, and with that item passing, that is our final item for Finance Committee. I'd like to now open the Public Works Committee meeting for June 6, 2022. <coughs> item number one, please. Consider approval of Public Works Committee minutes of May 2nd, 2022, or take other necessary action. Well, we all had a chance to review the minutes. Is there any uh, recommendations for correction or any motion for approval? Move for approval. I'll second it. Roll call, please. Shirley Hilton Flannery. Yes. Tracy Hoos. Yes. Tracy McGee. Yes. Alex Reynolds. Yes. Jamie Stout. <coughs> yes. Ivory Van. Yes. Deputy Mayor Derek Reed. Yes. Mayor Marlon Coleman. Yes. Item number two, please. Consider approval of the preliminary and final plat of the S and H Acres subdivision or take other necessary action. Ms. Bonheimer. Thank you. Good evening. Um, I have my temporary interim planning director hat on tonight. So this is a plat for subdivision filed by Dusty and Kima Hemingway. It's out by Harris Road by Country Club Edition. There you go. Okay. 
this lot consists of one, 1 1.19 acres. It's one lot in one block, and they are wanting to build a house on it, a single family home. This was approved by the subdivision review committee and re approved by the planning commission. <coughs> I think you have it upside down. There we go. If you can see, uh, the railroad tracks are over to the left, and if you come over to the right, the yellow squared area, that is the subdivision. Uh, the subdivision platting is, re is required anytime there's an area over 10 acres where there's going to be a residential house. And a close-up, you can see where that is. This is the design for the house. They've uh, followed all the setback rules. This will be a private sewer system at this residence, and the reason for that is the property it lays low, it lays too low, and it will flood and seep into any kind of septic system or problems that they have. They're planning on an aerobic system, and what this does is it, this, the sewage is filtered, treated, and then used to water the lawn. Uh, also, we can't access the city lines. We don't know where they are. We can't locate them, and we would have to bore under Harris Road. So uh, we are recommending approval on this, and I'm happy to, an happy to answer any questions. We don't have any residents signed up to speak, so we'll close the public hearing. Move for approval. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? No easement issues on this property, is it? No, ma'am. Thank you. Roll call, please. Shirley Hilton Flannery. Yes. Tracy Hoos. Yes. Tracy McGee. Yes. Alex Reynolds. Yes. Jamie Stout. Yes. Ivory Van. Yes. Deputy Mayor Jared Reed. Yes. Mayor Marlon Coleman. Yes. Item number three, please. Consider approval for Terracon to submit a work authorization proposal for professional Brownsfield services, which includes EPA grant writing to the City of Muskogee or take other necessary action. Ms. Bonheimer. Yes, sir. This uh, Terracon is a grant writing service. They've been in business since 1995. They have a very good reputation. They help cities write grants, grant applications to receive aid. Uh, Terracon has submitted a work proposal to us to help us obtain what's called a Brownfields grant. Brownfields <coughs> is a program that helps assess and clean up toxic waste, environmental hazards in cities. Terracon writes to help us write these applications, submit things, meet all the requirements for that. If we get the Brownfield grant, they will come out and do a free assessment of the city and try to find areas that are that are blighted by, by toxic waste and, con and contamination. The Terracon company is going to write this first one for us for free. The typical charge is nine to $12,000. Uh, the Brownsfield grant, if we get it, will also be free. Brownfields has provided over $50 million in EPA grants. Terracon has obtained over 12 million of that with their grant writing capabilities. So it's a really a, a big bonus to the city if we get this. If we get the first grant from Brownsville for the assessment, Terracon at a cost that can be no negotiated down the road will help us write grants looking for cleanup assistance, technical assistance. They can also figure out ways to reuse the contaminated materials if they can clean them up in an environmentally friendly way. <coughs> the first grant, again, is free. And if we receive the grant, that's free. The writing services are free. We are under no obligation to continue for further services. So we can contract with Terracon to help us submit this, <coughs> excuse me, this first application, get the assessment, the EPA assessment done for the city, and then at that point decide if we're going to go further. If for some reason, the, we don't get granted the 2023 fiscal year grant. Uh, Brownsville's going to issue all their criteria in September of this year. Then Terracon will help us update and resubmit it for 2024. So staff recommends approval, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Does anyone have any questions for Ms. Bonham? We have no one signed up to speak on this item. So do we have a motion? Move for approval. Second. I'll second it. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Roll call, please. 
Shirley Hilton Flannery. Yes. Tracy Hoos. Yes. Tracy McGee. Yes. Alex Reynolds. Yes. Jamie Stout. Yes. Ivory Van. Yes. Deputy Mayor Jarek Reed. Yes. Mayor Marlon Coleman. Yes. I'm number four, please. Consider approval of a methodology to qualify housing applica applications for the home rehabilitation program or take other necessary action. Ms. Bonheimer. Thank you. We have a, a rehab program for housing in Muskogee. We have a $200,000 budget. We have allocated up to $20,000 per house. We habitually receive more applicants than we have funds. The purpose of this program is to rehab houses. We look at, at roofs, at windows, at the woodwork outside. Does the house need siding? Um, and it's important that we, we help keep these up. There's a two-step methodology proposed. One is we have initial questions, such as is the city's investment going to prolong the life of the house? Is it going to make the house livable for years to come? Will it help beautify Muskogee and make the city a better place to live in? So we're looking at an overall, can we rehab this house? Will it benefit the city? And is it sustainable? We don't want to go in and throw a little bit of money at a house that's going to collapse in five years. We also look at the urgency of need. Again, we're looking at the roof, the windows, the paint, the siding, the woodwork. One of the things that we look at is if you look at a dilapidated structure versus a salvageable roof, for instance, if someone comes in and wants to rehab a house that looks like the first picture, we don't have the funds to do that. If we throw $20,000 at a house in that condition, it's not going to benefit the homeowners, it's not going to benefit the city, it's not going to make the house livable. The second picture you can see where it's a, a decent home but the, the roof is deteriorating, which will end up eventually making it look like the first picture if, if steps aren't taken. So that's our goal is to step in, rehab those types of homes, and make them livable. The second set is, of criteria is our ranking criteria. What we're trying to go through is, because we have so many applicants, is look at different things like the age of the people involved who are filing and requesting relief with their houses. We look at their income, the people, the number per house, whether they're veterans on Social Security, you know, what their circumstances are. And that helps us do a scoring point. Uh, this is not a very good picture, but it has an address and then it goes through and it lists the points under each category I just named. You know, if they're 65 years old, they're on Social Security, they're a veteran, they're looking at a better chance of getting rehab than a 30-year-old married to a 35-year-old and they both have incomes. So we're looking for better houses, happier lives, and a beautiful city. And staff recommends approval, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Sir, may I be recognized? Yes. <clears throat> Katrina, I know this project worked very, very, very well. On these houses, these $20,000 houses. Yes. Uh, nowadays, long years ago, when they first opened this program up, you could do roof, windows, siding, even if they had enough money left for a driveway. But the cost of everything now is, is things are going up. And like I say, you, roofs are high. Yes. <clears throat> and the problem that we had on these houses we wasn't getting the quality of work that should be done on these to put these people's houses back together, and I think now that I do, we have the same contractor. Do y'all know? If we have the same contractor doing the job now, to be it on these houses. I couldn't tell you. We'd have to. We'd have to look. I don't know who's doing the we, contract. We now. have one who's under contract that I we've had an issue with, and we're looking into that. I'm talking about the last one we had. Yeah, that's the one I'm talking about. We've had issues with them. We we've, we've had recent issues with them that have come to my attention. Yes. So okay. we, 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 I'm going to review their contract and the agreement with them. We may be looking at a new contractor. Okay. Now, do we still have an inspector, though? I'm sorry? Do we still have an inspector for these houses after they're uh, finished, completed? Do we still have an inspector? We have an inspector. Same inspector? The one we had toward the end of the program last year was a, was a really good inspector. Do we still have him? Yes. Okay, yes, I believe I, that he will work for us again. Okay, because I think Council McGee went out and looked at a lot of his work and said it was, he was good. It was good. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I, I was pleased with his reports. But I also have people call me years and years ago that these houses, the main thing is, like on the facial, mm -hmm. that white facial that's pretty and white when you first put it up, it's peeling now. 
the siding is I can take you around town and show you on these houses. The, the siding is even coming off. I think that's with the previous contractor that we had. I think there were there were issues with that. I mean, I'm looking into one house right now. Okay. That, that wasn't finished. The contractor has not been paid on it. And the inspector that uh, Ms. McGee saw his work, he did point out all the deficits with okay. that contractor. I just want to see these people. We're spending this $20,000 on them. I want them to have some quality work, mm -hmm. and along with quality material. Because, like I said, it's roll up. They got this roll stuff. They roll out and put their facial up. Mm -hmm. They also make a different type. If you go to people that spend a little money on their homes, they don't do it like that. Yeah. It's a little, it, it's different, it's different, it's done differently, you know? So, mm -hmm. like I said, I just want to see people with quality stuff. I agree. And one of the things that we're looking at is these are lower income people or older people mm -hmm. or people with, with disabilities. So the continued maintenance and upkeep is up to the homeowner after we do this. And that, that's part of, part of the problem, I think. So if we put decent quality materials into the rehab program, it should last longer. I totally agree. I'll turn the floor back over to you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I have a question, uh, Tracy. Uh, how we decided what section of town we're going to be doing? That's a big question. Um, one area that we have that we're looking at is not set in stone yet. Uh, Mr. Hazleton has started the methodology criteria for this project and the selection process. So I haven't had a chance to go over that. This is my sixth day as interim planning director. Okay. So, but I can get more information for you on that. Thank you. Of those 20, you haven't selected any homes at this point? Not at this point. We're just trying to set up the criteria to select homes. Who is selecting? Who is going out and determining that the homes are in quality enough to? Planning and then inspectors will determine that. It's, and also maybe, I don't know if anyone from the foundation is going to be involved or not. It's their grant money. So all of our funds that we receive for this is from the foundation. <clears throat> Materials and inflation are so high right now, 20000 is not going to go very far. No, it's not. And the quality of the person who is going to go and look at the houses is really important that they have the ability to understand what current contracting fees are, what materials cost, the fact that there aren't any contractors right now that are available. <clears throat> There's a lot of criteria they need to re-examine because it's all different from when they did this program before. I'll keep that in mind. i just like to say I'm, I'm happy to see them uh, extend the program and keep it going. You think after this we'll, they'll give us some more on the foundation? I, I think if we do good work, they might. They make it's a difference. A good, it's a good program if you got a good contractor. Well, and it's a necessary <laughs> program, I think. It's a necessary city. program, just like I'm saying with these older people mm -hmm. that I was, you know, dealing with. You couldn't, you know, they house, they could, you know, somebody could came out and worked on their home. Yeah, you know, I agree. It's a great program. Yeah, and it makes it, a difference. Is this a program where we go around to the different, kind of like we're doing the roads right now, we're going around to different areas of the city and uh, doing that? Are we going to focus all of this in one particular area, or are we going to move this around to different I'm areas? I'm not sure yet, to be honest. No, and this, that's one of the things I'm looking into. Council Reynolds, this program has been going on for more than 10 years. Mm -hmm. And back when the program was originally established, the city was subdivided into, I think, 10 areas. Mm -hmm. And so I think we're at area 10 right now. We've done areas one through nine. And so through the course of how the grant was run, there were no established methodologies for selecting applicants. It was just based upon until first come, first serve, till we ran out of money. And so now that there's been a delay, because I think we had a year where we didn't have any funding, so we've had those applications build up. And so now we have a number of applications and going through them, rather than using a first come, first serve basis, which may not give us the biggest bang for the buck, we wanted to develop a methodology uh, for reviewing those applications. And that's what is being brought for you today to, to make a determination of if you agree with what is being proposed for the methodology for reviewing those applications. Ms. Katrina, if you want to, and you have some time, yes, sir. I'm a, I'm a kind of hands-on person. I can take you around and show you some things that over the past this has happened on these houses. Matter of fact, I got a gentleman on West South Side Boulevard just called me two, two weeks ago about his house. But the key is, we got five years and for his warranty, and after those five years, the city's through with him. You know, they'll put the lien on it for five years, but after that, you know. But I think if you get with me one day, 
I can, I can take you and show you some things. Okay. And you'd be surprised. Like I say, I know these houses. Okay. Thank you. Trust me. <laughs> I think this is a great idea, uh, Katrina. And so with that, I would make a motion that we approve this item. Second. We have no one uh, signed up to speak on this item. Do we have any further discussion? Roll call, please. Shirley Hilton Flannery. Yes. Tracy Hoos. Yes. Tracy McGee. Yes. Alex Reynolds. Yes. Jamie Stout. Yes. Ivory Van. Yes. Deputy Mayor Derek Reed. Yes. Mayor Marlon Coleman. Yes. Item number five, please. Consider approval of resolution number 2900 declaring a parcel of property more particularly described in the resolution as surplus to the needs of the city and authorize the conveyance of said property or take other necessary action. Mr. Garvin. Mr. Chair, members of the committee, the city received an application from Denise Johnson to purchase a piece of property at 614 Fremont Street. The property consists of 5,000 square feet, therefore it's not a buildable lot. According to the resolution adopted by the city, it can only be purchased by an abutting property owner. Ms. Johnson is the abutting property owner. What she wishes to do is to, do, to consolidate the city parcel with her parcel so it will be large enough to build a single family dwelling and plans on building one in the future. I'd recommend approval. Thank Move you. Does anyone have any questions for Mr. Garvin? Move for approval. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Roll call, please. Shirley Hilton Flannery. Yes. Tracy Hoos. Yes. Tracy McGee. Yes. Alex Reynolds. Yes. Jamie Stout. Yes. Ivory Van. Yes. Deputy Mayor Derek Reed. Yes. Mayor Marlon Coleman. Yes. I'm number six, please. Consider approval of lowest and best bid from Intermountain Slurry Seal Incorporated in the amount of $1,759,223.17 for the Northwest Zone Micro Servicing Project number 2022008 or take other necessary action. Mr. Stewart. We are going to ask that this be forwarded to uh, Monday night without any recommendation. We've got some issues with the bid that we need to work through. Thank you. Next item, please. <clears throat> Consider approval of an agreement between the City of Muskogee and NCOR for day-to-day -day operations of the City Recycling Center or take other necessary action. Mr. Stewart. Yes, Mr. Rigney is going to address this issue. He's worked hard on this project. Good evening, everybody. Uh, so a little backstory, NCOR is a sheltered work program here in Muskogee, based out of Muskogee. They've been running our recycle center for the recent history. And what we're going to do today, or hopefully do today, is a continuation of the existing contract. It's five years with an auto renewing uh, aspect. And NCOR, let me get to my page here. NCOR agrees to pay the City of Muskogee the sum of $30,000 upon the execution of this agreement towards the costs incurred by the City in constructing a new building facility at the Recycling Center. So that has been agreed upon between us and NCOR that they would like to contribute that money to the new facility out there. Does anybody have any questions? Move for approval. Second. We have a motion and second. Any further discussion? Roll call, please. Shirley Hilton Flannery. Yes. Tracy Hoos. Yes. Tracy McGee. Yes. Alex Reynolds. Yes. Jamie Stout. Yes. Ivory Van. Yes. Deputy Mayor Derek Reed. Yes. Mayor Marlon Coleman. Yes. I'm number eight, please. Consider approval of honorary street signs to be installed at D Street and Independence and D Street and Kalamazoo or take other necessary action. Mayor Coleman. To the uh, members of this committee, I was approached uh, several months back about the possibility of an honorary street naming for the late Apostle Lathan Archie. Uh, I won't read all of the information in the uh, biographical sketch because my grandfather once told me that a good steak makes his own gravy. And so Apostle Archie was a monumental uh, figure in this community and is worthy of this recognition. Uh, we will work with uh, his wife and church family on the date for the unveiling of the honorary street marker, and I move for approval. Second. We have a motion to second. Any further discussion? What makes it so good, Mr. Chairman? This 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 is in Ward Three, right, Mayor? All right. <laughs> <laughs> I just want you to know that. Great street uh, great to street. be named after a great man who did great work. It's also in Ward Three. 
Yep. He should never be forgotten, and this is one way to keep uh, his works alive, is by to remind people of the great works of Apostle Lathan Archie. What was that he done, Derek, every, in the park? Praise in the park. Praise in the park, yeah. Yes. Thank you. Any further discussion? Roll call, please. Shirley Hilton Flannery. Yes. Tracy Hoos. Yes. Tracy McGee. Yes. Alex Reynolds. Yes. Jamie Stout. Yes. Ivory Van. Yes. Deputy Mayor Derek Reed. Yes. Mayor Marlon Coleman. Yes. <clears throat> At this time, we'd like to recognize citizens wishing to speak. We do have one signed up to speak, Mr. Gregory Fields. If you could, just approach the podium and give us your name and address, and you'll have three minutes. Thank you, thank you, thank you. My name is Gregory Fields. I live at 2717 Court Street. I was born here in Muskogee, Oklahoma. I've lived here most of my life, and um, I love the city. Now I'd like to have a word of prayer before we start. Bless you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Lord God, I ask you right now to search our hearts. If there's anything there that's not of you, we ask you to forgive us. Now, Father God, I ask you to remove me out of the way and let your Holy Spirit have his way. Give us a mouth and wisdom that the adversary won't gain Satan or resist. And then, Father God, we thank you that we know we can stand against the principalities, against the powers, and against the rulers of darkness in this world and against all spiritual wickedness in high places. I come this evening to talk about a halfway house, 2708 Court Street. It's right across the street from me. First, let me give you a little information here. I am the chaplain at Muskogee County Jail and at Wagner County Jail. I have no, no um, animosity about a halfway house. I used to be the shelter director of the Salvation Army, when at one time we had a halfway house there. But I don't believe a halfway house should be in the middle of a neighborhood. For one reason, I have a wife and I have great grandchildren. I have no idea or understanding who's next there across the street, there's about seven people. I ask you to search your hearts and ask yourself, would you like for a halfway house to be next door to you? A guy named Paul Callis and myself tried to get a grant for a halfway house to be built out around 54th Street where he had a nursing home there. Well, we couldn't get the halfway house there because of the zoning. So I'm asking how did this halfway house get in my neighborhood without anybody questioning us neighbors about whether we would in embrace it or not. And when I did do some research, I found out that they hadn't even applied for this. And now I hear that someone is trying to get them to do this and to do this, to put all their dots together and cross their T's. Well, that's like, to me, that's like giving someone who's done something wrong a reward. And again, I would just ask you to ask yourself, do you want a halfway house next door to you? And if the answer is yes, I'll try to talk to whoever owns it and tell them you have some property over there, maybe that they can come live there. I have a picture of this guy that, yep, time is over. God bless you. Can we the suspend the rolls and give him five more minutes? <clears throat> I'll second that motion. We have a motion to second any further discussion? I second it. Roll call, please. Shirley Hilton Flannery. Yes. Tracy Hoos. Yes. Tracy McGee. Yes. Alex Reynolds. Yes. Jamie Stout. Yes. Ivory Van. Yes. Deputy Mayor Jerry Creed. Yes. Mayor Marlon Coleman. Yes. Mr. Fields, you have five additional minutes. Thank you so very much. I have some pictures of a guy. Now, when I first saw this guy, I think I didn't have any pants on, and he was walking through the front door. Then a few days later, I saw him again out there, and I got my camera, my phone, I took pictures, but he did have on some pants. So after the meeting, if anybody cares, I can show you these pictures. It's, it's very uncomfortable. I mean, I deal with the inmates during the day, and I like to have kind of a refuge myself at home. And like I said, I, I have inmates to call me, guys to call me, 
and I can, I'll invite them to come by if they have a crisis. But I just, I'm just not happy, and my wife is not comfortable with this place. And we've lived at 2717 Court Street ever since 1980. That's home. That is our home. And now my wife is wanting to move. Not really wanting to move, but this is where it's going in our home. And I just don't feel like we need to just pack up and go. So I'm coming and I'm praying and I'm asking you all to search yourselves and, and help us to look out and see what's going on with this and, and, and find a different place for them to go. Because I know there are some other places other than 2708, which is their address, Court Street. We have children running around. You know, we, we've tried to improve our home and our neighborhood, and now this happens, and we're just, we're just, our hands are tied and everything. And knowing that this house is there, it's going to be, uh, it's going to affect our sales of our homes. And I've talked to our neighbors. And I was supposed to have been here the Monday before Easter, but I was in ICU at St. Francis. I got sick, and I think uh, Mr. Johnson spoke, and there were some of the neighbors here that, that night, and none of them are happy with this. And uh, I just feel the need to come before you all and ask you, we need some help. And like I said, this place was not they just came there. They didn't notify the city, because I checked on it. They just came in there and parked. And then once we addressed it, and I talked to a to the city planner, I think, or not the city planner, somebody, I can't think of his name, and a fire chief came, and, and we talked about it, and they saw everything, and they were supposed to check it out. And I think there's something like seven guys there now. So, um, I'm just asking to see what we can do about this, and thank you so very much, and you all have a blessed evening. Thank you, Mr. Fields. That concludes tonight's meeting. Everyone have a good night.